Thank you for coming on to Hard Black Upper Chest. All right. What's your name? My name is Prudence the Asset Smead. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. All right. Um, where are you from? I am from Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas. Oh, okay. Um, tell me about Oak Cliff. Oak Cliff. <laughs> Oak Cliff is in the southern part of Dallas. It's one bridge across from South Dallas. It's um, very urban, uh, low income. It has some rich parts to it, mainly black. Yeah. Uh, African American families reside in Oak Cliff. Um, okay. If you know the history of Oak Cliff, you know Oak Cliff used to be predominantly white. Okay. So, um, right over there by Cedar Crest Golf Course is where I grew up. I grew up um, in some apartments called Cedar Glen. Okay. One section of those apartments we were discussing earlier, right. it's gone, they knocked them out. But yeah, so I grew up in Oak Cliff, South Oak Cliff, went to Roosevelt High School. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> Bell, Bell Dogs. And um, I would say, I probably went from one end of Oak Cliff to the next because we stayed in Southern Oak Cliff, but my aunt, my, one of my favorite aunts, my aunt Rosalyn, she stayed in the richer part of Oak Cliff near Carter High School. Okay, okay. So, yeah, it was predominantly the, the top-notch middle-class right, black right. people back then. So, Home owners and everything. Right, you know, I go from the ghetto <laughs> to over here with, uh, what was it, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fresh Prince of Oak Cliff. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I kind of did that. So I had the best of both worlds when it came to Oak Cliff. I had the hood side, then I had the ugly side, the bougie side um, that I grew up in. Very, very rich culture when it came to our blackness, yeah. our roots. We had like our own little, our little, um, shit, our own little school, yeah. our own little hard knock, a hard knock school of ourselves in Oak Cliff. We, we, we did that. That's what's up. That's what's up. That sounds like an interesting, you know, <laughs> way to grow up. And I'm saying that like I didn't grow up. Look, listen. I, <laughs> so we we missed each other as far as growing up together, but um, I did grow up in some of the same parts. Actually, okay. uh, actually on Cedar Crest. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the house right there. Uh, and the apartments, you know, we used to go around there and and. You know, mess around with everybody. <laughs> and but, yeah. uh, I, I was shocked when you told me that they were like, there anymore. I haven't been over there in so long. Yeah. So. so the end, I lived on, I think we were in Cedar Glen. We were Cedar Glen South. Mm -hmm. So that whole apartment complex is gone. That was the end where when you were coming from the Cedar Crest Golf Course, you came down this long hill. Right. Down Sutherland onto Keith. And over to your left would have been the apartment complex. And right. it's complete. The only thing standing, and I don't even know why they left that, was the old nursery school, the, the Head Start school. Okay, place. I was just about to say the playground or something. Yeah, right. the playground. Yeah. That was right there. Uh, I remember sneaking over there taking pictures of my son when he was a baby. Man. But um, yeah, it's, it's got grass, beautiful, green. And that's huh? very poetic. It is. Because uh, it's beautiful green grass. You would never know an apartment complex stood there if mm. you hadn't lived there. Wow. You wouldn't have known it was full of bricks and homes and pipes and, and cement and foundation. You would not see that looking at it right now. And that's just still a very humbling feeling. Right. I heard someone say, and I just, I'm. I scroll on Facebook, I read a lot of things, I look at a lot of videos, so it doesn't even mean you. But I heard someone say that it, it, it seems like all the places where black people lived and died and uh, were buried, mm. per se, mm. that the grass is green, that it grows, mm. that where, where the grass is growing green and where there's a lot of lush land, that layer, that lays black, there lays black people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just saying that just kind of reminded me of that. It, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've heard 
that thing in that way, mm -hmm. maybe. But I'm pretty sure it has its truths that it would hold. You know, when I think about, um, and I'm just now learning some of these things. I think one of the uh, lakes in particular, mm -hmm. Lake Lanier, I think is one. If I'm not mistaken, that's Louisiana or Mississippi, somewhere around it's one of those. Yes, it's okay. one of those. Um, what I did not know and what I learned was that that lake sits on what used to be a black community um, that was burned to the ground. The people beat, murdered, ran out a lot like what it sounds a lot like Seneca Village, right. sounds a lot like Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right. Um, and so when I hear these stories, mm -hmm. when people go into that lake for their good time right. and they just have these very mysterious drownings or they go missing and some people's bodies are never recovered. You will pay a price. Yeah. But this you will pay the price. It's <laughs> either a very traumatic experience when I learned the history yes. of something like that, or it's a very uh, growing, evolving mm. experience, like the plush grass yes. coming out of it. And I, maybe it's a situation because that community of people did grow up and grow out whether it was forcefully or not right. maybe that's the representation of the greenery i'd like to think like that right on. i can dig that tell me about um the asset the asset yeah. <laughs> tell you about the asset yeah you want me to tell you about me the asset or do you want to know about the asset you are now my only source of information as to this term so Very inform good. me Okay, so we will take you on the journey of our sets. When I first got on the poetry scene, I was on the poetry scene as Prudence the Isis. Okay. And I took the term Prudence the Isis as my name because since I was a little girl, I was very intrigued, very drawn to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Anything Egyptian. Yes. And so as an adult, when I started out very early on the scene, I was um, one of the, one of the second or third places I was able to feature poetry was to Fiji Jazz Club. Okay. <laughs> Shout out to Felicia Bryant. Right. Um, she gave me like my first lounge professional platform to host and present an open mic, and it was poetry and jazz. We did eclectic nonsense and we did poetry and jazz. Nice. <laughs> so I'll never forget. This one night I was hosting and it was this beautiful woman sitting in the uh, audience. She had this blonde hair, black lady, beautiful uh, caramel skin, pretty hazel eyes. And she was just sitting out there enjoying herself and just smiling at me. And I, at first I thought maybe I knew her but didn't recognize her. But I didn't. I didn't know her. She was just nice. And so she, she asked me to come over to her. And she said, do you know what your name is? Do you know who you are? And I said, yeah, no, Isis is an Egyptian goddess. She's right. an Egyptian goddess. She said, no. She said, who is Isis? Mm. And I looked at her. And she said, I want you to go home. She said, and when you go home, I want you to look up Aset. And she spelled it A-U-S-E-T. Okay. So I did. And that took me on the journey that introduced me to myself. Because Aset is the commission, Egyptian goddess that we know as Isis. Uh. We know her as Isis because that is the Greek terminology. That's yes. the Greek translation for Isis. So for a very long time, early on, as drawn as I was to Egypt and anything Egyptian, I was learning the Greek philosophy of it. Right. I wasn't, it wasn't until I say right around 47 now, 47 years old. So I say right around 34, 35 is when I started learning my roots, my African roots, my Egyptian commission yes. roots. So that gave birth to me putting aside Isis. I don't ignore her because a lot of people know me by wow. Isis. And some people still call me Isis, but to be that pillar in my community, a person who also teaches when she's doing poetry, I had to become who I am. I had to take on that name. Yes. I said. 
um, not take on a personality. I right. said as a goddess, that's very real. Um, you can always tap into that divinity, just like you can tap into the divinity of my heart. Yes. So um, I carry Aset with me at all times. Um, I try to hold that balance in being the complete woman and being the mother of civilization. I'm often always looked to as the person to talk to or the I, I naturally become the mothering type person. So mm -hmm. it definitely fits. It's definitely who I am. You know, it's not like I'm putting on a mask and then taking it off. Right, right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And I mean, obviously, I say obviously, but obviously it has a lot to do with your foundation, right? Mm. Yeah, so you are founder. Uh, not only are you a p pillar in the community, you, you have actually founded something in the community that is a legacy and that will last. Mm. Uh, tell us, you know, a little bit about the Osset, you know, foundation. Well, this September will be my third year. Uh, <laughs> being yeah. the founder, executive director of the Offsets Foundation, Inc. Thank you. Congratulations. Very much. Thank yes. you. Uh, it's been a journey, to say the least. But um, that foundation, that legacy was birthed from my mother. When we were growing up in Cedar Glen Projects, my mother had a nun, or she helped organize and start a nonprofit organization, um, Urban Health Development, I think was the name of it. Mm -hmm. And it did just about everything the community needed at the time. Mm -hmm. um, before the Dallas Housing Authority took over, they were able to organize and create youth programs for us. Mm -hmm. um, we were learning how to cook, how to sew. Uh, the guys would learn how to work on cars and do oil changes. Wow. And this was all going on with the parents. The parents would take turns teaching us these things during the summer. Um, we had a free lunch program. Um, we would do little talent shows and stuff. And that's just for the kids. Right. On the other side of that, because again, this was a low income community. My mom and a couple of other um, adults would help the adults in the community and elders in the community who needed assistance. Like if they needed help getting their light bill paid mm. or getting the rent paid or if they needed to go to a food pantry because, you know, they didn't have enough food for that month or what have you. Right. Um, my mom and the organization would keep a list of other organizations that they partner with or that Dallas County could refer them to. Right. And they just helped. They, they became a, a resource center um, for the community and... I remember that and it, it was a, a very bad ending to it, but I remember how beneficial it was. I remember as I grew older, there were things that I experienced where I could remember that helping me. So going through life, working for different corporations, having different, you know, some people would say this girl is a jack on trades and that's what I'm <laughs> Right. But um, I've always been hands on in everything I do, but I learned very early that corporate America is not me. Mm. Okay. Okay. So I knew that I needed to get to my roots. I knew that I needed to get something uh, started that I can leave a legacy with, that I can continue a legacy. And the only thing I could think of was the nonprofit organization. Yeah. And so I developed this in a sense of mentoring the youth. Okay. And what what I've been able to do so far is partner with my alma mater, Roosevelt High School. And we've done a trunk drive. We've yes. done a trunk drive. It's been very successful. Very proud of that. And my goal is to begin in the summertime taking the select youth onto a mentoring journey, okay. if you will, a mentoring internship. Yeah. So based off of what they said their career path is, you know, like say for instance, they wanted to be a film director right. or producer. Based off of that summer's curriculum, if we're focusing on production, we bring these students in and we would team them up with you. 
They will, you would present to us a curriculum that could stretch them out for a month and a half, two months prior to whenever they're going to go off to college or right, go back to right. school because these would be sophomores to seniors. And you would take them through the journey of the process. You have to start here on paper. This is, you know, this is the equipment we use, but this is the equipment that's out there, right, you know. Right. Now, you can go and work for a company or you can be independent. This is what you need to look for when you work independent. These are contracts. These are, you know, how you got to pay your bills, how you have to pay people, budgeting. It would be a full program because my goal is to not only encourage the student, but to help them see the reality of it. Yes. When most people think entertainment, they think the actor. Mm -hmm. They think about the person that's on the stage. Um, they so may they think know. director. It's very seldom you think script supervisor. Right. Very seldom you think about the stage manager. Right. It's very seldom that you think about the light tech and the sound tech. And those are some of the most important yes. people to the puzzle. If it were not for them, <laughs> behind the scenes, you ain't gonna see them and you ain't gonna hear them. Yeah. And depending on what's going on, they might not make it out their own time. Thanks. You know. <laughs> so all of those things are important. And as an individual, these students can learn all of those things and get a feel for it. Yeah. And then decide for themselves what they want to master. And so that's that's my plan and my goal. Whether it's that, whether it's they want to be an engineer, you know, we pull in an engineer. We're going to have a two-month program, and this is what you do. We take them into an office setting. Y'all can do some paperwork and filing. This is right, how we right, start. Right. You know, I want them to be able to see the reality of what it is that they want to do. Yeah. I want them to understand that on no level, unless by some grand connection in the universe, you do not become... Successful in a millionaire overnight. Failure are your steps to success. Mm. If you're scared to fail, baby, you're not going to succeed. Mm. I need you to get out here and start fucking up. <laughs> I need you to get out here and start messing up with what it is you want to do. Yes. Because as long as you know it's safe to mess up, you know it's going to be all right when you get it right and you won't feel discouraged just to throw it away and go do something else. Something that you really don't want to do, but it's easier. Right. Don't do that. No. And I don't want it to be a mentoring um, situation where we're regurgitating what they're hearing in school. You know, I don't, I don't want it to be that, which is why we team up with the school. It's very right. important to me that myself and the mentors, the volunteers that we have in the program are in connection with the schools so that we're on the same page. Uh, right. Very important to me that we connect with the parents. Very important to me that we connect with the parents because in connecting with the parents, I can find the disconnect, mm. okay? Because the mentoring bridge is not because something is wrong. Right. It's just something gets, it's missing. It's missing, We, yes. we just gotta help, bring it together a little bit. Nobody's doing anything wrong at home we hope nobody's <laughs> right. doing anything wrong in school. We hope. Right. So we're just bringing it together and we're giving and, and for all we know, this may be the step to make the students say, you know what? I appreciate this, but this helped me realize that this ain't what I want to do. Right. And guess what? It's it. nothing wrong with it. And we have succeeded in getting you ready for the next goal. Right. We have, you've met this. You, you saw it, you, you went head on with it, you wanted to try it, you realized and trying it. You know what, this ain't for me. Okay, we can re, we, we can readjust, we can reevaluate that thing. So that's, that's my plan, that's my hope, that's my goal, and to um, still be able to pour into the community because I do still very much have an attachment to elderly. Yes. Um, so I'm always going to be there helping them get something filed or right. call somebody. So there's, there's a, um, a future goal I have set for the foundation to where I can start acclimating some of those uh, things I remember my mom, my right. mom doing. That's what's up. Thank you. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, that's beautiful for real. You know, um, it is, it is definitely needed. Yeah. Like, number one, you know, because it's the kids and the elderly that 
we kind of forget about it a little bit, you know, yeah. we get involved in our lives. Elderly especially. Yeah. Speaking of elderly, speaking of your mom, you said so many wonderful things about her. Right? Thank you, Ron. Yeah. She sounds dope. Like, my mom is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> my mom. people are mess. This, this is two things can be true. <laughs> no, my mom is a a beautiful woman. My mom mm -hmm. is um, she's very resilient. She's very strong. Um, but caring for my mom has opened my eyes up to a lot of things mm -hmm. um us our generation in terms of how we treat and see our parents yes. and then our parents in terms of their independence and the steps they chose you know mm -hmm. before getting to this point um being a kid i i, I never saw myself in this position mm -hmm. Being a caretaker is hard, especially for your own relative, for your own parent. Right. Um, you don't just go by and cook some food, wash some clothes, and talk. You are experiencing their journey into the next life. Yeah. Wow. Um, and it's stressful. I've I've gone to I've started therapy. <laughs> okay. And I would encourage anyone who's a caregiver for their parent or a relative, a close relative, to uh seek therapy. Dr. Uh Sheila Lamar has been the best thing to happen to me because I've got in a very dark place. I care for my mom 24-7. So there's been times when I've been very angry yeah. at my family for reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been times where I've been very sad because I'm not able to get off into my career the way I've uh, planned. Yes. But I am not regretful for being where I am in this space and in this time. Because I know if it weren't for me, my mom probably would not be here right now. Yes. So um, I'm very disappointed when it comes to the health care system, I'm very upset when it comes to caretakers and what they are thrown out. Yeah. Uh, just to be very clear, uh, most caretakers are not making more than $9 an hour. That's 2022. That's crazy. Um, anywhere you go and look, to find a place to live, you have to make three times the rent. I don't know where you can go and live, not even in the projects right. for $9 an hour right now. Right. So you have that, then you have the lack of help. The caretaking industry does not have adequate help. They don't have the skilled caretakers or the nurses to meet the demand. And that's how I got in the position that I'm in because what I do know and what we've always discussed is that my mother never wanted to be in a home. Right. And she didn't want to die alone. Okay. So it has been my mission in life to make sure that she gets that if I can't get her nothing else. My mom didn't retire, you know, 40, 50 years from a job. That wasn't her story. My mom, we, I grew up with my mom. My mom was on government assistance. Yeah. Um, knowing what I know now, I know my mom struggled with depression. Mm -hmm. Young, uh, growing up with her, young girl, teenager, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I just knew my mom had one anywhere, you know. Right. But now I know, and I know how important, I know how serious it is, and I can kind of see the struggle she was having in terms of her employment situation. Right. So we grew up on, uh, I grew up with my mom. My mom was on government assistance. So we went in and out of those things. Um, that played a lot in terms of where she is right now in our healthcare. She gets Medicaid, Medicare. 
um, that has carried her. That's kept her alive. Yeah. It has kept her alive. Social security ain't shit, right. but it has kept her alive and able to feed herself and able to help me maintain her bills, get her rent paid, things like that. Right. Um, housing authority, they have their issues, but they have helped. They have come in and, and bridged the gap yeah. where it needed to. You know, I can honestly say my mom was one of those people who needed the help and it served its purpose. Yes. Um, however, I still have a voice in saying that $600 a month is not adequate. Yeah. What the fuck is she supposed to do with that? And my mom worked. It's not like she never worked. Right. She did her community service. She put in her time. Mm -hmm. So things like that upset me, you know, outside of how you giving caretakers kibbles and bits for income. Right. You know, how you are treating your elderly, how you're setting them up. And I'll never forget, I think it was Jared Kushner, who it was either him or it was Trump Jr. who made the comment about elderly being the responsibility now of your children. It should be up to us. Well, guess what? She is. Yeah. And I turned my life upside down. I cashed in my 401k. I moved in with my mom because she has dementia. I didn't want her to lose her familiarity. I did all of that. And where did it put me? Wow. It put me almost in a position, if I'm not careful, to be like my mom. If I'm not careful, which is why... I do what I do. Yes. Which is why I stay focused on my careers, why I stay focused on my nonprofit, is why I stay working some little piece of remote job somewhere. And I use that job to be my investor for my nonprofit, yeah. to pour into what it is I want to do. Yeah, y'all don't work with me. Y'all know I have to be a real good job. <laughs> yeah. We ain't going to get into that right now. But anyway, <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's always a plan. There's a goal, and then there, there's a plan. The only thing about being in a situation where you're a caretaker is that it's day by day and nobody wakes up wanting to know that that was the day. Um, so you told us about, you know, taking care of mom, um, caregiving, um, you know, definitely the, the government has to, we're going to have to. At some point, someone's gonna have to look at, you know, how we're taking care of the elderly, how we how we address that situation. I, because I feel like it needs to be a very loud mm -hmm. sound from this community mm -hmm. in terms of no more. Yes. In terms of this has to change. It makes no sense. Yeah. I put it to you like this. If I were not in the position I'm in and I could not be in the same home with my mother to care for her and she had to be in a home, no one would still be looking after her. Yeah. They don't have enough people. And in, 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 in the care that my mom needs, she doesn't need to be placed in a facility where other people have to be tended to other than her. Right, right. And really, that's any elderly person in that position. They have lived their lives. They have worked. They have gave birth to children. And I don't care what those relationships are. And I'm not really tapping off into abusive things because that's not the family I'm in. Right. We cannot let our parents grow old and feel like they're okay. Yeah. Our parents are lonely, especially if they're not partnered up or married. Yeah. Our parents are losing mobility. Mm -hmm. They're losing memory. The apartment complex my mom lives in is an active senior citizen complex. They just found the man across the street from us dead two days ago. Mm -hmm. My mom has been in that complex for 17 years. I can tell you right now without exaggeration, that is normal. Wow. They 
have found a person dead in their home in that apartment complex almost every year that she's lived there. Which means your children are not checking on you enough. And the community not is not solid checking enough. Right. Wow. You, your parents move into those communities and you feel like they can still drive. They can still pay the bill. They still get on the phone. So you think mama is still okay. You think daddy is still okay. And he's not. Daddy is sitting outside forgetting where he is. Mm. You don't have a clue. Wow. Mama don't have no food in the refrigerator. Every time you come in there and open the refrigerator, you haven't noticed that there's leftovers from two, three weeks ago. Right. So her neighbor has been bringing her food. Wow. You don't visit enough. And the ones that do, you know, that's a totally different thing. That's a totally different thing. That's a different family dynamic. But there's too many of us who become detached from our parents yeah. when we grow up and grow out. And going through this with her, I see other elderly people doing the same. And these elderly people get mean. Yeah. They're bitter. They, I've seen elderly people get jealous of me. Or maybe I should say jealous of my mother mm -hmm. because I'm there caring for her. Caring for her. Yeah. They're jealous of that. They don't have it. Wow. And some of them don't even have a caretaker coming. Wow. So it's um it's weird. It's dark and it's crazy. But we have got to make some noise about this. Right. And making noise is not going to magically bring skilled people to work in their profession. But my hope is that it will turn the hearts of people to become compassionate enough to do it. Right. Because you gotta have it. Yeah. Or at least, you know, get more involved in a sense of family to where you, we, we as a black community start planning for our parents, older selves, their mm -hmm. older selves, their elderly life. Right. Because they're gonna have to be with us. Right. You know, if putting them in a home is not what you want to do, then, you know, don't get caught off guard like me. Go ahead and start planning for it. It ain't easy. It ain't fun. I cry way more than I smile. Right. I do. I have days I'm depressed, anxiety, but I push. I push. It's, it's, it's those people who support me. It's the therapy that I'm going through, yeah. you know. But it's necessary and it's needed. Yes. It's necessary and it's needed. You already mentioned that you see a therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, what other ways do you, you know, what other things do you actually do to help with your mental health, you know? Poetry. Poetry. I um I write script writing, poetry, uh, writing it, performing it, journal writing yeah. helps me. Um, in the past, I have been able, I was able to successfully do breathing exercises, yoga. Um, I have not been consistent with that. <laughs> <laughs> this go round. This, I'll be very honest. The bout of depression I had this go around was different. Mm -hmm. I went into a really dark place that yoga wasn't going to happen. Yes. And um, I needed professional help. And I'm glad that my best friend who I talked to allowed me to open up like that. And I'm glad that I wasn't ashamed yes. to go get therapy. I'm, I'm reading things where a lot of people feel a certain way. Yes about getting therapy and if I can encourage anybody to do it, please, this is you. This is you taking care of you. Yeah. Because I know if I had made that phone call, I I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not gonna say it would be like it, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be I know good. that. It wouldn't be good. Wow, that's brave, man. For real. Mm -hmm. But everybody doesn't have poetry and writing, you know, I don't know. Some people's outlet is music. Right. You know, whether you play instruments or you sing. Always. My mom used to tell me that too. When you leave your gift alone, it leaves you alone. Mm. So, um, 
in those times, find that feel good place. Even if the song isn't a pretty song, yeah. being able to get it out can probably help. Uh, painters paint, right. you know. A lot of people feel like they don't have a gift. Mechanics, mechanic. Hmm. You know, you get too far off into something, go fix something. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. electricians, take some yeah, wires out, just go <laughs> shock the seal. Oh, but um, that that would be my my advice when someone feels they're depressed or they're going through a heavy hard bout of anxiety or something like that mm -hmm. get very quickly to a a, a happy mm -hmm. calm state of yourself whatever it is in you that you do yeah and um do it for a few minutes mm -hmm. you know it's very cliche to say breathe but taking 10 deep breaths will save your life yeah no it will one of the main reasons I wanted to partner with BVM was because this election to me, mm -hmm. this local election yes. concerning the governor to yes. me, is more important than anything we've ever been faced with in our lives. This yes. is more important than when Obama ran. Because yes. when Obama yes. was running, he ran against uh, uh, McCain and yeah. what was that other baby's name? The white man, yeah. the, the, the uh, Mormon, what would it be? I know who you're Listen, that was entertaining. That was fun. That was a breakthrough, right. if we will. This shit right here in Texas come November is life or death. No, it's fast. If you can leave us with one thing, what's the la what is the one thing you want people to know? And what do you want to leave them with? Wow. What is the one thing I want people to know? What do I want to leave them with? Hmm. That's a loaded question. <laughs> the one thing I would want people to know is that no matter what life throws at you, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how tough it seems, you're here for a reason. You have a purpose. In those hard times, those difficult seasons are making you stronger. It's making you a better person for whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. And Giving up should never be an option. Don't ever throw in a towel. Don't give up because it's right at that moment. It's your breakthrough. You just got to hold on. Beautiful. Hold on. Prudence. <laughs> Thank you for coming on Hard Black Upper Chest. You are welcome. Thanks for having me.